Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your attention and uh, interest. And, and overall, thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of nature. It's very important uh, for us all. Uh, do I just use the? Yeah. Oh, very good. OK, got it. Um, as noted, I'm going to talk about today and share with you two examples of what uh, we at NatureServe and our, and our partners have been doing at the uh, really the continental scale, one in North, North America, the other in the tropical Andes, actually, where my uh, research interests have been for an, a number of years uh, there. And, and just want to share with you, if I can, a couple of key elements so that you can put in context. Some of you may know NatureServe, others perhaps not. but. Uh, uh, we originally were created about 40 years ago uh, with, the with the Nature Conservancy, and today we have over 80 programs across the hemisphere, and we really serve as the umbrella for a, uh, a network of a dynamic network of uh, knowledge leaders and data managers. Um, you can see that across the network we have over a thousand scientists and data managers working, and that uh, we're looking at well over 70,000 species and and uh, mapping 15 to 1,600 uh, ecosystems across the planet. So data management and the provision of knowledge, and I'll, something you'll hear me say several times, decision quality data is really important for us in terms of moving forward. So uh, just to put that in context, I'm also relatively new at NatureServe. I've, I'm the president and CEO for about five months. But I was, as Elaine mentioned, at TNC, and actually I served 12 years as the president of the American Hiking Society, bridging the uh, recreation and conservation interface. So it's really been fun for me to, to come back home. So let me talk about two examples. First one are the North American temperate grasslands. Uh, you see here, let me see, let me go back. This is the current major temperate grasslands, 14 types that you see uh, in terms of the historic extent, excuse me. But then when we look at the coverage today, it's obviously far less. Now when we talk about taking to scale and how do we share across from the Canadian uh, north to uh, the northern part of Mexico, how do we bring together and determine how we can actually achieve conservation at scale across one of the most threatened areas uh, actually in, in the Americas? Uh, not surprisingly, I think most of you know that uh, this is also one of the important breadbaskets of North America. Uh, cultivation, particularly in the eastern part, with heavy mechanized agriculture, which is of course very disruptive. A bit, bit more to the west, threats are a bit more on the grazing, but also agricultural side. But when you again think back of what the coverage we had, excuse me, the coverage we have now, and then this is an IUCN map of protected areas of categories one to four. Maybe a little hard to see, but what I want to focus your attention on is the following. This is a highly threatened set of systems, these 14 uh, grassland types. And if you look at the bottom, which I've circled in red, we have within all protected area types 1.2% of North America's temperate grasslands in any kind of protected area, at least by the IUCN categories. And we, when we look at our IG 2020 targets of looking for 17% of terrestrial and inland water systems to be pr protected within uh, some measure of uh, sustainable and effective uh, protected area management, we are nowhere close to achieving that. But what we have done and what I want to just show you now briefly, is that as part of the North American Wilderness and Protected Areas Committee, working with our colleagues um, also with the Fish and Wildlife Service, our Nate, what we did is we brought together all of our efforts in Canada, in the US, and in Mexico. And then what we did is we took a look at, uh, again, let me just go back so you can care, because these are time sequence. This is the historic extent but then we ran through a series of criteria and looked at that uh, current coverage and then came up with what we have rolled out late in 2016, what is mapped here of those 14 grassland types by using systematic methodology, very decision-ready data, and bringing together the experts 
that are working in the temperate grasslands from Canada to the U.S. to Mexico. These are the areas that we believe, whether from conservation or, and or restoration, that we believe would be the best bet for protecting the temperate grasslands of the United States. Now, what I showed you before is we had one point, little over 1% in any protected status. What I want you to look at now is that map I just showed you, if we were to both include in protected areas and or under restoration, what we would see, and this is where I want to be an optimist, if we put our shoulder to the wheel and we collectively as a conservation community do what is in business and agencies and communities across the board, you can see then, and I don't have time to go through this, but you can see that we calculate in this that if we were to put under some form of protection or restoration moving forward, we could actually get close to that IHE target and would in fact have 15% of, of high representation, uh, decision quality data is driving this, and we see this as one way to protect one of the most threatened and endangered uh, systems that we have, well, anywhere in the world, the grasslands uh, across the planet. So be thinking about that because we've been talking about at the, at the summit here the importance of collecting information at all points, but unless you speak common language and maintain a methodology and are able to communicate one to another and set a, uh, establish a set of shared goals, it's very difficult to come to a more optimistic future. And what, what has been done here with the North American Wilderness and uh, Protected Area Committee that we work on, which has all the federal agencies represented as well, but we were doing this particular analysis with the committee, we see opportunity here. There's hope. And hope, and we hope then, of course, it will direct the kind of investments that we want to see in time, money, sweat equity, and the future of uh, research and conservation priorities. I see a lot of young faces in here, and I, I do have to say, my hat is off to the Smithsonian and to the organizers for, for doing the deep reach. You've exceeded, uh, certainly, my expectations of seeing younger uh, uh, professionals coming into play, because you are truly the future in this. And this could be a very pros profitable, hopefully, uh, both professionally and uh, uh, from a, just a, you know, your future in their life. Second one is an area that's near and dear to me where I've spent all my time uh, as a research biologist. I'm a tropical plant ecologist by, by training in the high Andes and, and in the Galapagos, as was mentioned. Um, a second project that we worked on, which I wanted to share in terms of looking at big science at big scales and seeing is the tropical Andes biodiversity hotspot. Now, it's one of 35 hotspots that we're at, whether you believe in the hotspot concept or not, in, in terms of looking at that kind of organization. It's the second largest in geographic scope. It is the number one in terms of biodiversity by a significant margin, frankly. You've got a number of mega diverse countries in there, including the number one country, I would say, uh, Colombia. Uh, seven countries across, tremendous challenges, tremendous biodiversity, quite a bit of poverty, obviously, as well. And so the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, which uh, uh, Conservation International manages with a number of, uh, of uh, uh, very important uh, high-level investors, we've heard from some here at the, uh, and donors uh, here at the uh, summit, very important. But what we wanted to do, and their task to us was, how can we look at their future investments? They were going to make a new investment. Uh, this was in 2015. Uh, a new investment of another $10 million. And they wanted to say, well, where would be the best places for us, to, given the current and the projected landscape that we have? And when you talk about an extraordinary uh, diversi uh, diversity of habitats, uh, challenges, threats, including narcotics, violence, um, unsustainable agriculture, you name it, that uh, Tropical Andes has it, what we took to task, and it was a team from NatureServe and a, and a group out of Ecuador called Ecodecision, uh, we put together a team from each of these countries, worked together to identify the uh, using key biodiversity areas as the unit. We ended up coming up, and this is a very big number, 442 <laughs> terrestrial key biodiversity areas and 29 corridors identified. Now that is a huge 
portfolio to look at. You can see them. I'm not going to list them off, but if you, I hope you can read them if you have a favorite country up there. You can see that there, we identified some significant uh, property uh, landscape that uh, would be covering a vast array of the, of the d distribution of the biodiversity in, uh, in this particular hotspot. But this was not enough. This, is, this does not get to a decision, uh, tree, uh, decision matrix at all. It's way too many numbers. So then we continue to refine this. And this is where I want to emphasize how important it is to have the kind of collaboration across boundaries and to be speaking a consistent language of how you are, you are, are collecting your information, analyzing it, and then ranking key biodiversity areas or particular species. Because then what we did across these seven countries is we whittled it down and these were the recommendations that went up. I hope you can see that. Well, that probably doesn't come through very well. We took those 442 down with 29 important biodiversity corridors connecting them. And if any of you have worked in this area, you know how extraordinarily complex it is across the Andes, Amazon, and then to the coastal dry forests, uh, et cetera, of, of this part of the world. We came up with 36 key biodiversity areas located in seven corridors across four countries. And they're mapped there in the green are the areas, the KBAs we call them. And then in the kind of, I don't know what color that is, kind of pinkish, I guess, for you, um, were the corridor. The point here I want to raise, and then I'll, I'll stop because I know we're moving, moving along, um, is that this major funder asked us for recommendations. You cannot make recommendations, decision quality recommendations, unless you have a common language. Unless you have a methodology that you do share, you have an understanding between the, the experts that you have, and I see several people in the room who've, who've undertaken this kind of thing as well. And I just want to underscore that in this particular case, like in the previous one with the grassland, because we had that critical mass of people with that common language, we were decision quality data, we were able to produce the kind of analysis and recommendations that will lead to meaningful, sustainable conservation outcomes. And again, this is something that's very important. These are really difficult landscapes to work in for different reasons. But again, because we put, put together the right science with the right people at the right time, we're able to see, I think, a, an optimistic and bright future. So thanks. Thank you.